Number one. I am a female bartender at a small cafe that doubles as a venue. During the day, we serve coffee and lunch, and at night, we have a full bar with bands, comedy shows, etc. On this night, there was an open mic comedy show. Not a lot of comedians showed up, so we ended up closing up shop early, and I was ready to go home. I had a patron come in and order a single beer during the comedy show. He was acting nervous, but being a female bartender, I get male customers that are shy or don't want to talk to women, so I didn't think much about it. He sat down, sipped his beer, and watched the show. Since we closed early, everyone was pretty much gone, and I wanted to lock up and clean so I could get home. After I escorted the last couple out of the bar and got ready to lock the door, I see the man from earlier walk down the back hallway and into the men's restroom. Not even a minute later, he bursts through the door yelling, Hurry! Come back here! I need help! I stood at the opposite end of the hallway and asked him what was wrong. The toilet is overflowing. There's water all over the floor. Help me! Help me clean this up! I could tell that something was wrong, and I replied, It's okay, man. It happens. I'll mop it up. I'm just trying to close up right now. He continued to argue with me, trying to get me to come into the bathroom with him as I stood about 20 feet away down the hallway. Finally, he walks towards me very aggressively and tries to grab my arm. You need to come back here now, he says. I immediately put my hands out in front of me so he cannot come any closer, and I tell him he has to leave. He walks outside, and I lock the door behind him. I check the bathroom, and it is completely spotless. No water on the floor at all. I flush the toilet and urinal, and they are both working fine. I start to get nervous, and I take my large pocket knife and clip it to the waistband of my pants just in case. As I'm cleaning our espresso machine and putting toppers on the liquor bottles, I hear a tapping noise. I look up at the front of the store, which is one big window that has a few curtains covering it. The same man is tapping on the window, waving at me and laughing like a maniac. I watch him walk over to the door and pull on it. It doesn't open since I had locked it after he left. He starts screaming and pounding on the glass, saying, Open the door. I'm going to kill you. Fight overcame flight at this point, and I walked around the counter and about six feet from the door. I pulled out my knife and locked eyes with him and yelled, I'm calling the cops. Get out of here. He smiled and walked out of view of the window. At this point, all of my adrenaline just crashed. I locked myself in the office and called 911 crying, explaining that I'm alone and a man tried to lure me into the bathroom and was outside trying to get into my bar. I waited an hour and a half. No police showed up. I called my boyfriend and he drove up to the shop. My manager watched the security cameras from home, making sure that the man didn't come back. I did the deposit and immediately drove home my boyfriend following close behind me. My male busboy has been coming to work with me so I'm not alone, and the managers have been keeping an eye on the security cameras while I'm working. Number two. When I was 20, 21, my fiancé got me a job at the gas station he managed at. It was a tiny convenience store, open 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. in one of the seedier parts of town. As summer was approaching, we decided that once college housing closed, we would move in together. As luck would have it, a small house opened up about two blocks from where we worked. It was across the street from an elementary school, and it allowed dogs and had a giant fenced-in yard. It was priced pretty perfectly as well. We ended up moving in on April of 2011. Since my boyfriend and I worked opposite shifts, 
the convenience store only having one cashier on duty at a time, we didn't see each other much. I usually had the night shift and he took afternoons. I would walk to work most days and as I clocked in, he'd clean up and leave in his car to do errands around town. We drove fairly similar cars, so it left our house usually with just mine out front during daylight hours. I'm pretty sure many people thought I lived alone because of this. After I got off work, I'd lock up and walk home. I never left earlier than 11.30 p.m. By this point, I'd gotten to know most of the people in the neighborhood, and it didn't worry me at all to be out after dark. If someone did attack me, I knew who lived in basically every house between the store and mine and could find help. I also know some basic self-defense and have a tendency to walk with my keys in my fist. In short, I felt safe. It never occurred to me that I was being targeted. It started at the end of May. I checked our mailbox one afternoon to find a letter addressed to me with no return address. My name had been spelled incorrectly and my last name omitted completely. I took it inside and curiously opened it. Inside was a three-page love letter from a secret admirer. It was sweet, a little grammatically incorrect, but frustratingly enough, very vague. I shrugged it off. It wasn't the first time I had gotten unsolicited notes from a stranger. My boyfriend saw it when he got home and teased me about it. It wasn't until the next day we realized that somehow this stranger knew my address. The next letter came a few weeks later. This time, the writer spelled my very unique name correctly. Another lengthy love confession was enclosed, but this time with a set of drawings. The drawings all included my name and were done in the style of tattoos. Most had hearts or roses, some had been diligently cut around with an exacto knife, it seemed. They were beautiful, but scary. I put everything back in the envelope and stashed it away with the first letter. After that, a third letter showed up with more drawings. This time, the writer included some identifying marks about himself. He had three dots tattooed on the web between his thumb and index finger on his left hand. His right elbow had a spider web tattooed on it. If he wore shorts, I could see stars tattooed on his knees. He let me know I could find him if I looked. Finally, he told me he'd been watching me for a while at the gas station. He thought I was cute, funny, and nice. He'd love to get to know me better. I updated my parents with my newfound knowledge, and my dad panicked. The tattoos the writer described were all gang-related. He insisted I go to the police, which I did. Of course, they couldn't do anything. I went to the postmaster. His hands were tied as well. I realized I'd been followed home at least once by this guy in the dark. My boyfriend wouldn't let me walk to work anymore. I bought pepper spray. Our head manager left a baseball bat behind the counter for me. For the first time in my life, I was scared of another human being. After the third letter, my admirer took a hiatus. I didn't receive another letter from him until August. Finally, it had a return address, the state pen. It held another handful of drawings, another sweet letter, and a request to write him back if I felt so inclined. He signed it, almost childishly, yours forever, Jose. I took all the letters and stored them deep in a dresser. I'm sure I've lost them by now, between moves and all. And I'm sorry, my artistic friend, but I've decided we will never meet. Number three. I am a female corrections officer, prison guard, or CO, in a state with a relatively high number of death row inmates. However, few executions are actually carried out. I used to work for a large county, 
but I work for a different agency now. This county was my first CO job years ago, and before that, I had worked in retail and customer service while studying criminal justice, so I was really green. I used to be very liberal. I'm still liberal about a lot of things, but the job does change your perspective for most people. One thing I used to believe very strongly was that no human being could be truly evil. This particular county jail is one of the oldest in the country, so parts of it have a totally linear layout. What I mean is that you have a long stretch of corridor with cells on either side, and the COs have to walk up and down to supervise the inmates. I am actually giving enough information for anyone with good Google-full skills to figure out a lot. As you can imagine, these linear layouts are not in style anymore because you cannot see every cell at the same time, but every inmate can see you. I have to say that units like this are extremely creepy too. I am going to call this corridor the condos. We did not call it that, but I do not want to share the exact term which is specific to this jail. Less than 10 years ago, a quadruple stabbing homicide happened not far from where I grew up. The murderer, Michaels, described it as a butchering and he killed his former girlfriend, her family, and their neighbor because he came over when he heard the screams. When the police found Michael soaked in blood and asked him what had happened, he said, it's obvious, I just killed everyone. The cops said that he seemed completely emotionless when he said it. At that time, I had only been a CO for about four months and our facility received him as a pretrial detainee. Now, obviously, he wasn't our first or only murder, but the nature of the crime, stabbings indicate a more dangerous personality than a shooting, for one thing, and his lack of remorse was horrifying. He was considered a volatile inmate, so we placed him in an observation cell in the middle of the condos where a CO could always keep an eye on him. He would stand at his glass door in silence most of the day, just watching everyone. I swear he only really spoke when he had visits. He actually had a full visit list of these big goth girls who would come in and swear they were in love with him. I don't know if this means anything, but his ex was a big girl and he used to draw pictures of the fat female COs. For note, he was skinny and white with brown hair. One day, I was working as a utilities officer, basically a floater who relieves people for breaks and helps out as needed. At this jail, utilities officers also get away with a ton of downtime and BSing. I was hanging out at one end of the condos where you could look down and see a lot of the jail talking to another officer on duty. As they say, there are no secrets in jail, plus I was aware that there were points throughout the jail where you could hear very well into neighboring cells, that sort of thing. We were being pretty quiet though, plus we stood a good 50 yards from Michael's observation cell. Also, you have to imagine it would be difficult to stand in the observation cell and press your face against the glass to see the people standing at a right angle so far from you. I was telling the other CO a funny story about my weekend, which I wouldn't do out on a correctional unit nowadays, but we weren't getting into anything too personal either. It was a long story involving my fiancé at the time. I wrapped up talking to this CO because I had to go to a gate to relieve another officer for chow and I had to pass Michael's cell. I didn't like walking past it because he stood there and stared at you and back then I wasn't so good at hiding my nervousness. He always had his head slightly tilted down so you could see white under the irises of his eyes, again rarely saying a word. 
but today was different. I took one step past his door and I heard him say, Edgecombe, in a barely audible whisper. I didn't even know he knew my name. Yes, our last names are on our uniforms, but I was never his primary officer and we'd never interacted. It caught me off guard, so instead of ignoring it, it stopped me in my tracks and I backpedaled to the door. He pointed to his mouth and I leaned in to listen. His eyes looked so dark. I remember I felt hypnotized. He proceeded to recite word for word the story I had just quietly told the other officer at the end of the condos less than two minutes before, even copying the sound of my voice down to a subtle lisp. This seemed to go on forever. I felt like we were the only two there, no 22 millimeters of glass protecting me, just a five foot tall female and a murderer. I remember thinking for the first time of another human being. This is evil and unfixable. Finally, I said, Sir, did you need something? He started to laugh hysterically, <laughs> and I walked away. I have been assaulted by other inmates. I've had piss thrown in my eyes. People play mind games with me constantly. I've met some damn good lip readers too, but this was like something else. Now I work at a maximum security institution where I babysit all rapists and murderers and pedophiles. I don't know how to make it make sense to you that this was the one and only time in my life where I felt inside of me like I was dealing with something not human. Michaels is in another institution now. He is on death row. He refuses to appeal. He made it clear to the press that this decision is not out of remorse. He has none. He just doesn't care, and it is most logical in his mind for him to die. Inmate Michaels, if you ever do get out somehow, please, let's never meet again.